Добрый день. Good day, everyone. Do you know that the most dangerous place in your home is the kitchen? And the bath is only the second place. So you need to make the space around you safe. About this and more we will discuss in this lecture. And of course, the basics of first aid. What is the most dangerous place in the house? Yes, the kitchen. The kitchen is dangerous due to the fact that high temperature or even an open flame is used when cooking. The result of careless handling of fire is burns or even a fire. If gas is used in the kitchen, an explosion may occur. To prevent this from happening, you need to regularly check the equipment. You need to immediately call the short number 104 in Russia if you smell gas. If you use gas in a cylinder, it is better to keep this cylinder not in the kitchen but on the street. Then the result of the explosion will be less destructive. There is also a lot of electrical equipment in the kitchen. Electric stoves, electric grinders, electric kettles. If the equipment is faulty, an electric shock or fire may occur due to a short circuit. If you are not an expert, do not try to repair electric equipment yourself. Call a specialist. If the electrical equipment is installed not by a specialist, but by a neighbor who wants to earn money, the result may be unpredictable. Pay attention to the electrical outlet that is installed, right in the dishwasher. And of course, an electrical wire is a potential danger to children and pets. If there is a child in the house, it is advisable to close the sockets with special plugs and disconnect the wires when the equipment is not in use. Burning with hot steam, boiling water or hot oil also happens quite often in the kitchen. All hot items require increased caution. Sharp objects, especially knives, are also dangerous. When working with a knife, you cannot rush and be distracted by other things. All sharp objects should be hidden from children. Toxic substances should not be stored in the kitchen. For children who cannot read, they are the most dangerous. Look at the pictures. On the left is not juice, but a means for disinfection of toilets. On the right is not candy, but poison for rats. Dishwashing detergents can cause dermatitis with prolonged use. Therefore, it is better to wash the dishes with gloves. The kitchen floor may become slippery from spilled water or oil. Regular cleaning is needed to prevent injuries. The floor in the kitchen is better made of non-slippery materials. The second most life-threatening place in your home is the bathroom. If a person has heart problems, it is better for him to avoid a hot bath. Possible loss of consciousness and drowning may occur. In addition, there is a risk of slipping and falling on wet surface. In order not to fall in the bathroom, you can use a non-slip mat, non-slip stickers and handrails. The next risk factor in the bathroom is electricity. During the Soviet Union, it was forbidden to install electric outlets in the bathroom for security reasons. In Russia, this ban was lifted after the appearance of cheap washing machines that could be installed in the bathroom. The appearance of sockets in the bathroom immediately caused deaths. This photograph is not a joke. Because of this, a man really died in Russia in 2013. And here again, I must warn you against hiring quote-unquote broad profile specialists who are inexpensive. An electrical water heater is also often installed in the house. It is reliable as long as two parts work well. A thermostat and an emergency re pressure relief valve. The thermostat is installed at the factory and sometimes they forget to screw the valve onto the pipe or they save money on buying it. 
If the thermostat breaks down, the temperature of the water comes to a boil. The pressure rises. If the emergency pressure relief valve is working properly, it releases some of the water from the tank and the pressure decreases. If there is no valve or it is faulty, you can see the consequence of the explosion in the photo. The water tank is very heavy. Therefore, make sure that it is well secured and does not hang over your head. The Criminal Code of the Russian Federation has Article 125, Abandonment in Danger. If someone saw a person who needed first aid and did not help him, this is considered a criminal offence. Punishment, a fine up to 80,000 rubles or imprisonment for up to one year. There is a saying, if you don't know what to do, act according to the law. The rules and procedures for first aid in Russia are written in the Order of the Ministry of Health and Social Development of the Russian Federation, number 477N, dated May 4, 2012. On approval of the list of conditions in which first aid is provided and the list of the first aid measures. Since the lecture is intended for students studying in Russia, I will continue to talk about first aid from the point of view of this order. This is a list of conditions in which any adult should provide first aid. I remind you, under threat of prosecution. 1. Lack of consciousness. 2. Respiratory and circulatory arrest. 3. External bleeding. 4. Foreign bodies of the upper respiratory tract. 5. Injuries to various areas of the body. 6. Burns, effects of exposure to high temperatures and thermal radiation. 7. Frostbite and other effects of exposure to low temperatures. 8. Poisoning. Before you begin to provide assistance, you should access the situation. Are there any threatening factors for your own life and health? As you understand, providing first aid near a car that may explode or near a pole that may fall is a very bad idea. If there are such threatening factors, you first of all must eliminate them. For example, turn off the gas, turn off the electricity, put out a burning car or move away from it. Further actions, accessing the number of victims you must make sure that none of the victims went unnoticed. Removing the victim from the vehicle or other hard-to-reach places. Moving the victim to a safe place where he will be given first aid. If the victim is conscious, his emergency extraction is performed as follows. The hands of the first aid participant are held under the victim's armpits, fix his forearm, after which the victim is removed outside. When removing a victim who is unconscious or with a suspected injury to the cervical spine, it is necessary to fix his head and neck. At the same time, one of the hands of the first aid participant fixes the victim's head by the lower jaw and the second holds his opposite forearm. Moving the victim alone with support it is used to move easily injured persons who are conscious. Moving the victim alone by dragging. It is used to move victims with significant weight to a close distance. It is desirable to use in victims with injuries of the lower extremities. Carrying the victim alone on his back. It can be used to carry victims who have a small weight. It is not used for carrying unconscious victims. Carrying the victim on his hands. It is used by persons who have sufficient physical strength to use this method. In this way, it is possible to carry victims who are unconscious. It is undesirable to transfer so injured with suspected spinal injury. 
carrying the victim alone on the shoulder. When carrying in this way, the victim should be held by hand. This method is not used when carrying victims with injuries to the chest, abdomen and spine. Carrying the victim together on a four-handed seat. The hands are taken in such a way as to grasp the wrist of the other hand and the hands of the assistant. The fixation of the brushes should be strong enough to hold the victim. After the formation of the seat, the victim sits on it, after which he is lifted and transferred. The victim can hold onto the shoulders of the people carrying him. Carrying the victim together on a three-handed seat with support under the back. In this way, the transfer of victims who have a risk of losing consciousness or victims who cannot stay on the seat with four hands is carried out. Carrying the victim together on a three-handed seat with support under the back. Carrying the victim together by the arms and legs. When carrying in this way, one of the first eight participants holds the victim by forearm of one hand, thrusting his arms under his armpits and the other under his knees. Carrying a victim with a suspected spinal injury. To carry a victim with a suspected spinal injury, several people are needed who, under the guidance of one of the first aid participants, lifts and carry the victim. When carrying, one of the first aid participants must fix the victim's head and neck with his forearms. It is more convenient and safe for a victim with suspected spinal injury to carry it on a hard, flat surface, for example, on boards. Now that the victim is in a safe place and he is not in danger, for example, of a gas explosion, you can spend time calling an ambulance and other special services. When calling the short number 112, you need to inform the address, what happened, the number of victims and their conditions, what kind of assistance is being provided. Do not rush to interrupt the call. If the dispatcher has no questions, he will disconnect first. The next step is to determine the presence of consciousness in the victim. As a rule, this is obvious, but the first question of its quality remains. Is consciousness clear or confused? The victim is recommended to ask questions that will help not only clarify the situation, but also give an idea of the clarity of his thinking. Examples. Do you know where you are? What happened to you? Have you taken any medications? Do you have diabetes? Did you take something or drink something? Do you suffer from epilepsy? Do you have heart problems? In the absence of breathing, the chest of the victim will remain motionless. The sounds of his breathing will not be heard. The exhaled air from the mouth and nose will not be felt by the cheek. Then, the first thing you need to do is to restore the transience of the respiratory tract. To do this, you need to tilt the victim's head back with a chin lift. Push the lower jaw forward. The next step is to determine the presence of blood circulation. To do this, you need to check the pulse on the main arteries. The next step is to perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation until the signs of life appear. The base of the palm of one hand is placed on the middle of the victim's chest. The second hand is placed on top of the first. The arms are straightened at the elbow joints. The shoulders are positioned above the victim so that the pressure is perpendicular to the plane of the sternum. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth artificial respiration. The resuscitator, after taking a deep breath and tightly pressing his mouth to the patient's mouth, blows air into his lungs. 
At the same time, it is necessary to hold the nose with the hand located at the forehead of the victim. The output is carried out passively due to the elastic forces of the chest. The number of breaths per minute should be at least 16 to 20. The inhalation should be carried out quickly and sharply, in children less sharply, so that the duration of the inhalation is two times less than the exhalation. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth artificial respiration. Air is blown in through the nose. At the same time, the victim's mouth should be closed with a hand, which simultaneously moves the jaw upward to prevent the tongue from sinking. It is necessary to ensure that the exhaled air does not lead to excessive stretching of the stomach. In this case, there is a danger of releasing food masses from the stomach and getting them into the bronchi. Artificial respiration using an artificial respiration device. It is possible to avoid direct contact with the patient's mouth by blowing air through a gauze napkin, a handkerchief or any other loose material. With this method of long ventilation, air ducts can be used. The next step is to give the victim a stable lateral position. To do this, you need 1. Remove the glasses from the victim and put them in a safe place. 2. Kneel down next to the victim and make sure that both of his legs are straightened. 3. The victim's hand closest to the rescuer should be taken aside to a right angle to the trunk and bent at the elbow joint so that her palm is turned up. 4. Move the second hand of the victim through the chest and hold the back surface of the palm of this hand at the cheek of the victim closest to the rescuer. 5. With the second hand, grab the victim's leg farthest from the rescuer just above the knee and pull it up so that the foot does not come off the surface. 6. Holding the victim's hand pressed to the cheek, pull the victim by the leg and turn him to face the rescuer in the side position. 7. Bend the victim's hip to a right angle at the knee and hip joint to keep the airways open and to ensure flow. Tilt the victim's head back. If it is necessary to maintain the achieved position of the head, place the victim's hand under the cheek. The final result should look like this. If you suspect spinal injury but you need to leave the patient, put him in a modified stable lateral position. Straighten his arm above his head and turn the body so that the head lies on the straightened arm. This is the position of Haynes. High arm in endangered spine. Once again, make sure that the airway is passable and the patient has not stopped breathing after moving to a stable lateral position. Conduct an overview examination of the victim for the presence of bleeding. One of the methods of stopping bleeding is finger pressing of the artery. The temporal artery is pressed with one finger to the temporal bone in front of the auricle, 1 to 1.5 centimeters from it with bleeding head wounds. The mandibular artery is pressed with one finger to the corner of the lower jaw when bleeding from wounds located on the face. A very large vessel is the common carotid artery. It runs along the front surface of the neck to the side of the larynx. This artery is pressed lower, closer to the heart, if it's damaged to the cervical vertebrae. Then a pressure bandage is applied, under which a dense cotton roller made of bandage cotton wool or napkins is placed on the damaged artery. The subclavian artery is pressed against the first rib in the fossa under the collarbone when the bleeding wound is located high on the shoulder, in the shoulder joint area or in the armpit. When the wound is located in the area of the middle or lower third of the shoulder, the axillary artery is pressed against the head of the humerus, for which 
leaning one finger on the upper surface of the shoulder joint, the remaining fingers squeeze the arteries. The brachial artery is pressed against the humerus from the inside of the shoulder. To the brachial artery is pressed against the humerus from the inside of the shoulder to the side of the biceps muscle if the bleeding wound is located in the lower third of the shoulder or in the forearm. The helper supports the injured limb with his left hand and the first finger of the right hand squeezes the artery, leaning with the rest of his finger on the outer surface of the shoulder. The radial artery is pressed against the underlying bone in the wrist area of the first finger when the arteries of the hand are damaged. The femoral artery is pressed in the inguinal region to the pubic bone by pressing with a clenched fist. If the femoral artery is damaged in the middle and lower third, with arterial bleeding from a wound located in the shin or foot, the popliteal artery is pressed in the popliteal fossa, for which the thumbs are placed on the anterior surface of the knee joint and the rest of the artery is pressed against the bone. On the foot, the arteries of the rear of the foot can be pressed against the underlying bones. Then the pressure bandage can be applied to the foot and with other arterial bleeding, a tourniquet can be applied to the shin area. Bleeding can be stopped with a tourniquet. Control of the correct application of the tourniquet, the absence of a pulse, bleeding. The tourniquet is applied as close as possible to the area of damage. The time of applying the tourniquet should be written on the clothes, a piece of paper or the patient's skin. The tourniquet is applied for two hours in summer, for an hour or an hour and a half in winter, necessary warming the limb. Then you need to make a finger pressing of the artery, slowly loosen the tourniquet for five to 10 minutes under the control of the pulse and then apply it again a little higher than the previous place. Such temporary removal of the tourniquet is repeated every hour while each time making a note in the note. The tourniquet should not be applied to bare skin. The tourniquet should always be visible. The harness can be by improvised means. A belt, strips of fabric, in the form of twists. In any case, do not use a wire for twists. Another option for stopping bleeding is maximum flexion of the limb in the joint. Another option to stop the bleeding is to apply a pressure bandage. Another option to stop the bleeding is to apply a pressure bandage. The next step is to conduct a detailed examination of the victim in order to identify other injuries poisoning and other conditions that threaten his life and health. If any are found, we need to provide assistance. Do not hope that a person has only one problem. The procedure of action. 1. Conducting a head examination. 2. Performing a neck examination. 3. Breast examination. 4. Conducting a back examination. 5. Examination of the abdomen and pelvis. 6. Carrying out an examination of the limbs. If necessary, we put a bandage on the wounds. The photo shows the application of a sealing bandage when the chest is injured. In the case of fractures, immobilization is needed. This can be done with the help of improvised means. Before applying an improvised splint, it is necessary to wrap it with a bandage or wrap it with a cloth or clothing. It is necessary to fix two or three joints depending on the fracture site. If there is a special ladder tire, it is easier to provide assistance. It is necessary to apply a splint over the clothes and shoes of the victim without correcting the position of the limb. 
a trauma specialist will already put the bone in the right position. If there is a suspicion of injury to the cervical spine, fixation of the cervical spine is needed. The easiest way is with the use of medical devices. And if there is nothing at hand, show imagination. An example in the figure is the fixation of the cervical spine with improvised means. If the victim has drunk a dangerous substance, it is necessary to rinse the stomach. If acid or alkali gets on the skin, they need to be removed from the surface. The damaged surface should be washed with plenty water. In case of injuries, thermal burns and other effects of high temperatures, local cooling helps. In case of hypothermia, it is necessary to transfer the victim to a warm room, change into dry clothes, warm up, give a lot of warm liquid to drink. When help is provided, it remains to monitor the condition of the victim. That's consciousness, breathing, blood circulation as well. And provide him with psychological support. The final step is to wait for an ambulance and transfer the victim to specialists. If you did everything right, you will not be sued and just maybe get a thanks in appreciation. Thank you all very much for your attention and see you in the next one.